Hello, it's Keith here and this is lesson one of the multi-platform series of my ARM assembly programming tutorials. The multi-platform series is where we look at code fragments which you can use on any system that's ARM based because all this actually relies on is the functions of the processor itself so it doesn't use any kind of hardware specific code. Now today we're going to start looking at some code elements that we're going to use in a little game that I'm writing for the ARM processors called Suckshoot. This is a game I originally wrote for the 6809, then I ported it to the 8086 and now it's the turn of the ARM. It's a very simple shooter where we have a flying bat that flies um, closer towards the player and the player has to move a crosshair onto the bat and shoot it. Now to make this game we're going to create some functions today. We're going to create a random number generator and we're going to create a range checker. The random number generator is of course to decide the position of our bat in the game and the range checker is so that we can check if the player has shot the bat. Now we've got a very early version of the code here which only has the positioning of the bat and the movement of the cursor. Uh, we can't shoot, the bat isn't really flying out yet, it's just a starting test to test those two functions. Now you can see I can move my cursor around the screen but when I get close to the bat well, that's when the range checking um, detects we've got close to the bat and we're overlapping the bat, the bat will move to a new position. So you can see we can now test the range checking and we can move all around the bat on all sides but whatever side we get too close to on the bat, the bat will move to a new position and the bat is always in a position on the screen. So we've got a range checking, a random number generator and also um, a random range limit so that we can specify a maximum and a minimum that is acceptable from our random number generator. Now, I should say that the random number generator we're showing today is definitely not the best random number generator. In fact, it's more likely to be the worst. However, it does have one advantage, and that is that this random number generator is the same random number generator that I've written on all of my platforms in my tutorials from the Z80, 6502, 68000, the 6809, the 8086, and now the ARM. And I think I've got a PDP 11 version as well somewhere. The point is that this is a pseudo random number generator which creates repeatable random numbers. That is, if we give it the same 16 bit random seed, it will give the same 16 bit output every time. And this means we can use it to create pseudo random generated levels. So we can create a series of random numbers based on a predictable seed. And that means our level will look the same each time that we play that pseudo random generated level. And even on multiple platforms, that's that's the plan for the generator anyway. So it's, a, it's not an amazing random number generator generator but it is a viable one it creates reasonably acceptable random numbers there's no holes in the random range it creates and as I say it can, you can use it to create 8 or 16 bit random numbers and they are predictable if you need them to be so so that is what we will be looking at today okay well let's go over to our source code and let's take a look okay so the first thing we need to sort of look at is uh, our random number generator can work in sort of two modes. One is that we provide a random seed to it as a number in a register. The alternate one is we just ask for random number numbers and it stores its own previous random seed and autom automatically increments it. And so we've got a memory address here for the random seed if the software is tracking the random seed by itself. Now, when we want to move our enemy, we're using this randomize enemy function here. If we just have a look at that, here's the code for that function here. So this is the start of the code here. And we're using this little function called do ranged random. And we specify a maximum and a minimum to do that. Now the routine is very simple itself. All we do is we run the do random function, which returns an 8-bit value. That's the 8-bit version, and it automatically increments its own random seed. And we're then just comparing to the maximum and minimum that we've declared acceptable. And if it's not within that range, we just repeatedly pull more random numbers until we get one. And as I said before, the random number generator will create every possible permutation and combination between 0 and 255 in the 8-bit range. So eventually, we will always get a value that is acceptable to our range. So that's what we're doing to position our bat. Now, in addition to the random seed variable, we do have two lookup tables that the random number generator uses. These are 16 byte lookup tables, and these are used as part of the random number generation. Okay, well, let's take a look at how the random number generation works. Well, we've got two random number generators. We've got do random word, which will create a 16 bit random number in R3 and R6 from a 16-bit random number in R1. Now, the reason it's split into two parts is to maintain the functionality of the versions on the Z80 where uh, there were two 8-bit registers that made that up. It, it was more practical for me porting my programs to keep that functionality split into two parts. Now, the do random function just creates a single 8-bit random number in R0, but the way it actually does this is it uses the do random word function and then it eors the two parts together. 
and then just masks them to a 0 to 255 range. So the do random word function is actually used in both cases. Now, how does the do random word function work? Well, it uses the two parts of the random seed, the top byte and the low byte, and these are used to generate two separate random values using two different random generators that work in two different ways. And the reason that we use two random generators is it was originally designed to work and create 16-bit pseudo-random numbers from a 16-bit seed, but that seed was possibly only going to go up by one each time the routine was executed, and I wanted both bytes to radically change every single time. It would be no good if there was a very obvious pattern in the random numbers as our 16-bit number only went up by one single unit each time. So the, the, this is the sort of best I could come up with at the time, you know, using two different random generators created a, a, a good apparently random pattern, at least in an acceptable way for the purpose that I required at the time. Now, our first random generator is very simple, and this is in some ways based on the ZX Spectrum one. It's a very simple concept. All we're going to do is we're going to bit shift our one byte value, our one byte random seed, and then we are going to do a variety of EORs. Now, we, we have got a 16 bit seed in two byte values, but because we can't rely on both of them changing, one of those may always be zero every time we run this. You know, if we're incrementing our seed by one each time and we increment it only 255 times, the, the second byte will still be zero every single time. So we can't rely on that second byte making a significant random difference. Now, on this system, we do have a little bit of a problem. Now, we're going to be doing bit shifts and usually we would be rotating within a byte and the bits would go round and round in circles. So if we push a bit off the bit zero, we'll come back at bit seven. Now, the arm is, of course, using 32-bit registers. And so we're going to have to mimic that functionality. So what I'm doing is I am rotating the source byte to the left by 24 bits, and that is effectively doubling it up so that the two copies, so then when we shift a few bits, the, the bits that were pushed out will have effectively come back in because we copied those bits to the second byte of our register with this function here. So we're loading R0 with the first seed here. We're then duplicating those eight bits to the second eight bits. We're then rotating to the right by two bits and EORing again with the random seed. We're then once again, copying that byte to the second part. We're then rotating again to the right by two bits. We're then EOing with the second seed. We're then copying the bits again. We're rotating right by one bit, and then we're EOing with this rather strange value here. This is just a sort of generic random value here that we've put in. And then we're once again EOing with the first random seed again. And then finally, we're masking back to make sure we've only returning a single byte. Now, let's say this isn't some this isn't going to create amazing random numbers, but they are at least reasonably random appearing. And as I say, they don't need anything except a random seed that's passed in, and they will look at least superficially reasonably random. So that is the first random generator that I use. Now, the second random generator works very differently. Now, if we just did the same again for the first, as this first random generator, just with, for example, maybe some different shifts and a different EOR, both of our bytes in our 16-bit value would would represent a very distinctive uh, pattern. You know, we'd, we'd see that they were moving in tandem. So I do something very different for the second one, and that is I use those lookup tables, but I use as an offset for those lookup tables in one way or another our two random seeds. So first of all, for the first part of the value, I take random seed two, I mask the bottom four bits. I do some EORing here just to I say, make sure again, it doesn't start from zero basically. And then we load in a byte from our random lookup table using that as an offset. Now that gets our first value that we're going to use, but we're going to combine a second value from the second lookup table. But we don't want to just use the same uh, seeds in the same way because we will again get a very distinctive pattern. So we're actually using our first random number generator to produce the offset for the second random seed. And then we're masking the bottom four bits again because we've only got 16 values in our random table. We're getting the offset to the second random table, loading in a byte, and we're then EORing the two together and then we're masking back down to a single byte. So both of these will provide a single byte. And then when we're doing our do random byte here, we are EORing these two together to get our final result. The do random word will, of course, return both together because it's designed to return 16-bit values. 
So that's how we're randomly generating our bat positions and that's how our bat is able to move around the screen. But what about this range checking? Well, the range checking is a very simple concept really. Basically, we have got, our, um, if we look at this diagram here, we've got our object that we have as our base and then we've got our object that we want to test. And we're gonna specify a width and a height range and we're going to test for the position of the second object within that range and the way we're going to do it is we're going to subtract our range basically moving our test position to here and checking if our object is greater than that we're then going to add that twice moving to the other side of the range and check if our object is lower and if it's higher then we're out of range and then we'll do the same for the y-axis so we're basically going to do a, a simple range check to see if our object is within range of the player now in this case we're using it to see if the player has shot the enemy but in other games I've used this to detect if the player has been hit by the enemy or if the player's hit a wall or um, maybe to make an alert sound you know you can use it for anything you want but um, it's going to be important to have some kind of code that can do this kind of function in your game so let's have a look at what we've got so we've got this range test function here now this function will be passed some parameters and our registers R2 and R5 are the object, first object here, the X and Y position. R1 and R4 are object 2. And R3 and R6 are the X and Y width and height of the range that we're considering to be a collision. Now the way this works is if we're in range, we will set R0 to 1 and we will clear the 0 flag. If we're out of range, we will set R0 to 0 and we will set the 0 flag because we're using move S there to set the flags. So that's how this is going to work. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to move the X position of our first object into R0, and then we're going to subtract the width of the range that we're going to check. Now, if this causes an overflow, then we've effectively gone below zero, and zero is the minimum that this will work. It's designed for a 256 pixel wide screen. So if we've gone below zero, then we are, by definition, unable to do the next comparison. We're going to skip it. The next comparison is to see if the object that we are comparing to is lower than the range after we've subtracted our maximum width. And if it is, then it's obviously completely out of range. So in that case, we will skip to range test out of range. If it's not, however, we need to test if it's on the other side of the range. So now what we're doing is we're adding the width multiplied by two. We're shifting to the left by one bit, effectively multiplying our width by two, and we're adding that. We're then comparing to 255, because if it's over 255, then we must go on, have gone over the far side of the screen. And if so, we're gonna skip the next comparison again. Now, what we do then is we're comparing again to the X position of our second object. If the second position is greater than the value now that we've added the maximum width of the range, then our object is definitely out of range. Otherwise, it's in range on the X axis, but it might be directly above or directly below us, in which case it's still out of range. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do the same for the Y axis. So we load our zero with the Y position, subtract the height of the Y range, Again, if we've gone out of range, we're going to skip the next check. If we, if not, then we are going to see if the object is below the current position that we're testing. And if it is, then again, we're definitely out of range. If not, then we're adding the height of the range multiplied by two, seeing if we've gone over 255. And if we have, we can't do the next test. But if not, then we are going to see if our object is above the current position of the maximum bottom range there and if it is then we are going to skip but if not then uh, this object has passed all of our tests so that means that it, we're clearly within range of the second test object and the way that this is being used within our code here is we are loading the position of the enemy object here the bat in this case now the player position is already in the registers two and five here. So all we need to do is set the width and the height and we've set them to eight pixels here, which is a nice tight range. So we have to get really on top of our bat before it disappears. But if we change these, maybe we want a looser range for a different purpose. If we could set a very big range of 32 here. And now if we move our bat around, move our object around, you can see we, we don't get very close at all to our bat before our bat vanishes to a different position. So yeah, it's just gonna depend on well, partially the shape of the object. If you've got a very wide object, you're going to want a wide, narrow range. But it uh, also depends on what, what you're using this for. Is it for, in this case, a targeting? Is it for hurting the player? Is it for warning the player? Is it for changing the AI of the computer when the player starts to get near? It's really going to depend on your requirements. Anyway, 
that's all we've got today. Yeah, if you've liked what you've seen, please go to the website, download the source code and the build scripts and all that kind of stuff. And as I always say, if by some miracle you manage to use this in a commercial project, go for it. I don't care. You do use it any way you can get some benefit from it. Um, and the thing, of course, is if you've liked what you've seen, if you subscribe, you're going to see the next episode because um, so we're going to continue building this little sub shoot game. We're going to build it on the Game Boy Advance, the Nintendo DS and the Risk OS is, hope, is the hope. So it should come out on all of those systems. And we're going to be looking at some more modules we're going to need to complete this game. We're going to be looking at binary coded decimal next time. So if you stick around, hopefully you'll see that and hopefully you enjoy it. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed what you've seen today. Thanks for watching and goodbye.